Hey guys, this is Everything Medical. Welcome to the part 2 of the commonly tested ECGs. If you haven't watched the part 1 of this series, I highly recommend you to check that out as well. Moving on. This is a very important ECG. So let's suppose a person comes to the emergency department with a stab wound on the front of his chest. He has severe left-sided chest pain, unstable vital signs, low blood pressure, and his heart sounds are distant. You do his ECG, which shows this particular pattern. The first thing that you will notice in this ECG is that the voltage of the QRS complex is not the same everywhere. The voltage is highest here, and look here, the voltage is lower. In other words, the voltage on the ECG is alternating between high and low. This phenomenon is called electrical alternance. Can you guess what the pathology is? Well, I hope you're thinking cardiac tamponade, super important condition for the exams. Here, you can see another ECG showing the classic ECG pattern of cardiac tamponade. In the exam, I want you to look for two things. First is the low voltage QRS complexes, as you can clearly see here. The second diagnosing point is, of course, the electrical alternance, the alternating voltage of the QRS complex that I've already shown you in the previous ECG. Keep in mind that cardiac tamponade is a very serious condition. It results due to the compression of heart by the presence of excessive fluid in the pericardial cavity. As a result, the heart is unable to contract properly. Another high yield fact about cardiac tamponade is that on physical exam, it shows a triad of physical findings, often called as Beck's triad. Beck's triad means the patient will have hypertension, distant heart sound, and distended neck veins. On ECG, you'll see electrical alternance because of the heart swinging in the fluid and of course low voltage QRS complexes as well. The cardiac tamponade is a medical emergency and immediate pericardiosynthesis is required to drain the fluid that's compressing the heart. Before we move on to our next high yield ECG, can you please subscribe to my channel for more videos like these? It will help me a lot. Moving on. Now you're looking at two more very important ECGs, not only for the exams, but also for the real life medicine as well. The ECG on the right represents hypokalemia, which can be caused by conditions such as chronic kidney disease, excessive use of laxatives, insulin overdose, or even the use of drugs like amphotericin B. The ECG in hypokalemia is characterized by flattening of T wave, as you can see here, and presence of an unusual wave right after T wave, which is known as the U wave. On the other side, we're looking at the ECG changes that happen during hyperkalemia. One very important example of hyperkalemia is diabetic ketoacidosis. Although both hyperkalemia and hypokalemia can occur during diabetic ketoacidosis, so keep that in mind as well. In hyperkalemia, the ECG shows a characteristic peaked T wave as you can see here. The T wave in this ECG of hyperkalemia is really huge and tall as compared to the normal T wave. Again, in hypokalemia, low potassium levels cause the T wave to flatten and the rise of U waves seen here. On the other hand, in hyperkalemia, increased potassium level causes the T wave to peak and scoop. Simply speaking, the height of the T wave totally depends on the level of potassium. If the level of potassium in the body will be high, the T wave will spike. And if the level of potassium in the body is low, the T wave will flatten. I hope this will help you in picking up both hyperkalemia and hypokalemia ECGs in the exam. Moving on, this is another very commonly tested ECG. Let's suppose that a 65 year old person suffering from chronic heart failure has been taking high doses of beta blocker therapy. One day you perform his ECG and you see this particular pattern. If you look at this ECG, everything appears normal except that the interval between P wave and R, also known as the PR interval, is way too large as compared to the normal. Look at the normal PR interval here in the normal ECG. Now look back at the disease ECG. You can clearly see that the PR interval has increased in length. Can you guess the pathology? Well, I hope you're thinking about first degree heart block. This condition is very important for the exam. Here is another ECG showing first degree heart block and you can see that the PR interval here is super long as compared to the normal PR interval. The prolonged PR interval is how you're going to diagnose first degree heart block in the exam. Keep in mind that the first degree heart block is an asymptomatic and benign condition and does not require any treatment. 
The classical scenario by which you can be tested is a patient coming back from a hiking trip and one month later he develops a target rash, facial nerve palsy bilaterally and his ECG shows heart block and you should immediately think Lyme disease with such a presentation. Moving on, we have to learn second degree heart block as well. There are two types of second degree heart block, Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2. We'll look at both of them separately. The diagnosing point of Mobitz type 1 heart block is that on the ECG, the PR interval keeps on increasing with progressive beats. Here, you can clearly see that PR interval is short here and then increases a little with the next beat and then increases to the maximum extent and then finally a QRS complex is dropped in a beat. Again, short interval here, then a bit longer here, then a bit longer and then a beat is dropped. This ECG pattern is diagnostic for Mobitz type 1 heart block. Let's move on to the Mobitz type 2 heart block. The main point I want you to remember for Mobitz type 2 is that in Mobitz type 2, the heart beats are dropped randomly. In other words, any beat can be dropped and the drop beats are not preceded by a progressive lengthening of the PR interval as compared to what we have seen in Mobitz 1. In Mobitz 1, the PR interval kept prolonging progressively until a beat was dropped. But Mobitz type 2 is different as you can see here. The PR interval remains constant and then suddenly out of nowhere there is a drop beat. Moving on to the third and most severe type of heart block, the third degree heart block. In the ECG pattern of third degree heart block, you can clearly see here that there is no particular pattern in the ECG. There is no association whatsoever between the P wave and the QRS complexes. For example, look here, there is just a lonely QRS complex without any P wave behind it. Similarly, look here, there is a lonely P wave with no QRS complex next to it. The reason that the P wave and the QRS complexes are disassociated with each other in third degree heart block is that the atria and ventricles are beating independently of each other and totally on their own pace. Please remember that third degree heart block is a very serious condition and often can be fatal and it is treated with a pacemaker at the hospital. Keep an eye out for a classic scenario of third degree heart block involving a patient with the symptoms of severe Lyme disease such as bilateral facial nerve palsy, arthralgia and target rash. This association between third degree heart block and Lyme disease is very commonly tested. Moving on. This is our last super important ECG and this is the worst kind of arrhythmia that you can possibly have. This is an ECG pattern showing ventricular fibrillation and you can clearly see here that there are no distinct P waves, QRS complexes or even T waves. The waveform is just completely chaotic with no recognizable pattern. The usual heart rate during ventricular fibrillation can reach up to 300 beats per minute. This is another complete ECG showing the ventricular fibrillation and to diagnose it you have to look for the characteristic completely erratic waveform with no distinguishable P waves, QRS complexes or T waves whatsoever. Ventricular fibrillation is a medical emergency and most often a fatal condition. So if you are in the emergency room and patient presents with ventricular fibrillation, you have to immediately initiate the CPR protocols and use the defibrillation technique if you have to. Similarly, if you get a question in exam in which the ECG shows ventricular fibrillation, you choose the option which has something like CPR or defibrillation as the best next step. If you want to know the books that I used for my exam preparation and the ones that I highly recommend for mastering the ECGs, I've pasted the links to the books in the description box. For more videos like these, please subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell. The written form of this ECG review is in the description box. We also provide online tutoring services, so check that in the description box as well. That's it for today guys and I'll see you in the next video.